Um, if you check your Moodle, uh, if you check your Moodle course, I've uploaded some extra materials for uh, fitting a polynomial curve. Actually, it's at, at the end of your lecture five PDFs as well. So I just wanted to make sure you don't miss that. It's just a case study of uh, fitting uh, different, you know, degrees of polynomial uh, throughout some of your training data sets. And I've been asked from a friend of yours that what's going to be the, the tentative uh, dates for your assignments and your perhaps your midterm. So normally, I'm, uh, for this assignment, I just wanted to make sure that you are taught enough of materials so that you can follow with the, the assignments, right? The first assignment would be in MATLAB. So by the end of this week, perhaps in a, in a few days, I'm going to uh, post the first assignment. You have perhaps two to three weeks, or e even, even fewer days, because it's not going to be a, a long assignment, to, uh, to submit your results to, to, uh, to the course TA. I'll announce another uh, announcement on uh, Moodle about your TA. I guess by now he is back in Canada. So he, uh, for your assignment-related questions, you can always refer to him. Then about the midterm, as you know, we have um, the, the, the second week of, of, of October as your reading week. So the first Monday after that, uh, you have your midterm. Again, to, to double check everything, I'm, I'm going to post another assignment for that. Apparently, on, on that Monday, there is a religious um, holidays. I'm not sure. Uh, a student brought, brought this up on the other course I'm teaching. So. To avoid any uh, conflict, I'm going to uh, postpone your midterm on Wednesday after your uh, reading week. And your midterm would be in class. You're going to be asked some questions and you're going to write it on, on the paper. So that's not going to be a big deal. Um, what else? Your second assignment would be in, uh, in TensorFlow and Python. So uh, if, if you haven't started working on that, you can, just, uh, use, you can use my extra materials on Moodle to start working on Python. It's pretty easy, just like MATLAB. Just install uh, TensorFlow, or perhaps you can find it installed in, in lab machines. If not, just installation uh, requires a few seconds. You just can download the library and use it. And that's for that as well. Any questions before we start? It's October 23, yeah? Yes. But I'll, I'll uh, post an uh, announcement to make sure everything is settled. Yeah, so you know. And those grad students that... Um, they need to take either a project or a, or a paper. Make sure to uh, send me your proposed project or papers by the deadline that I mentioned in the, in the second lecture. All right. What is it? Uh, maximum 90 minutes, perhaps. Yeah. That's your class. Yeah, I I'm, 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 I'm make sure it's going to fit in your class time. Yeah. All good? All right. So, previous session, uh, previous lecture, actually, we talked about linear regression, and today we're going to talk about some examples about linear regression. Okay. So, as a recap, we we arrived to the point that we are interested in finding the optimal weight, which we call W star, which is a minimization problem of your in-sample error, right? So, the vector of W. So, what we need to actually um, calculate is the a minimization method using various techniques to find the difference between your line that you feed through your data and the actual data which we represent with the with the y here. And we we talked about uh, various methods. We specifically focus on these two methods: analytical solution and and a geometric one. We mentioned that there are other techniques uh, on how to minimize. Uh, a, li a linear regression problem, which are generally called least squares method. So we talked about the analytic solution and the geometric one. So for the for the solution of the least square, we we formalize it as a W of least square, which is equal to calculating your pseudo inverse matrix, right? So also we talked about the the properties of this matrix. What's going to be the size when you are dealing with um, large data sets? If it's a tall matrix, if it's a, uh, a fat matrix, or, we, or if it's a square one, right? And then we um, provide some notions about the geometric interpretation. 
and we talked about uh, the answer of the least square is actually a projection matrix onto your subspace P, which which is uh, which is actually the the lowest distance between that y and y hat of your prediction. And we talked about how we're going to uh, arrive to that. We actually use column span of x. So today we're going to talk about a few examples on, on both cases, right? And also, let me just wrap this uh, spanning definition again. So we call a set of vector spans a space if every other vector in the space can be written as a, a linear combination of this spanning set. All right, so, and that was the recap on the overall uh, linear regression algorithm. So we, we have to construct the, the metrics of input. We call it the design metrics. Includes all your um, training data, all your x's, and their respective labels. And then we have to compute the pseudo inverse. Either we do it this way or we uh, use it, we use a geometric method. And then the return of this would be the w, right? And we have to find a way to minimize this to arrive to the best w, which we call it w star. So that was the overall method we talked about in the previous lecture. All right, so now let's have a look at the first example. Uh, linear regression. So say we have three points, 0, 6, so x on, uh, on this 2D space, so we have 0 and 6, which is this point. We have 1 and 0, and then we have 2 and 0, right? So uh, actually 1 and 0 would be the other point. So I'll fix it here. Okay. So now, clearly we can see if we want to fit a line using a linear regression, which is uh, roughly speaking that blue line, we call it L, there is no way we can fit a straight line in these three points because they're not, you know, they're not on a straight line. By definition, we can assume that um, let y equal to w0 plus w1x be a straight line and that x x of 0, we call it the um, superficial or artificial coordinate, right? So if you want to find a line that passes through these three, first we need to write down the, the matrices, right? So the first one is your matrix of x. As you know, all the x zeros are 1. That's why you have all these ones here. And this is representing our x1, and our x1s are here, one, 0, 1, and 2, right? For the respective x, you have the same uh, rows of y's. In this case, there are 6, 0, and 0, right? So if you are interested in finding the w of the line, and such w that minimizes the error when we fit through this tree, right? So this, the, sum, the, the square error of all these three spaces should be minimized, right? So that's the problem. We want to solve this. All right. So if we calculate the y hat, it's going to be equal to the multiplication of your x and w. And when you multiply that, you're going to have W0. On a second row, you have W0 plus W1. On a third row, you have W0 plus 2W1. And the in-sample error or your training error would be equal to, we have three points, 1 over N, and your estimation of Y hat minus this or this minus that is the same. And this is your, your normal vector, right? So we need to calculate this which is 1 over 3rd, and that's your... We need to compute the norm of this for that. Now, let's see how we're going to minimize the error for this in-sample error of W. Sorry, 
What is it? The last row, uh, like x times w. From where we got, but we'll use 0 plus 2w. So it'll be on the w. If, if you mul multiply those matrices. Yeah, but So this is wrong? Oh, this is? This one? This one. This one. Oh, this should be two, right? OK. Yeah. Thanks for pointing out. I'll, I'll, I'll fix the slides. Yeah, there are. Yeah. I do typos all the time, so make sure to, to just pinpoint them. All right, um, okay. Now, if you expand this norm, right, you're gonna have one over third, double to zero minus six to the raise of two, double to zero plus double one to the raise of two, and then double to zero plus two double one squared, right? Now, the task is how to minimize this. Let's first uh, visualize what we're going to see here, right? Okay. So actually, these are, if you expand those three, these are actually locus of points. These are the location of some of the points within that level set that we are seeing on this double zero and double one, which is a two-dimensional visualization of your 3D space, right? So that's, uh, we talked about this 3D space and this shape that we call a paraboloid. So if we project it into two space, if we look at it from the top, so we're gonna have those level sets, and each level set corresponds to one of your E-ins, right? And your double star that we, ar we arrive to the point of 5 and 3 for your W0 and W1 is actually in the middle. So we are, in, in, we are interested in uh, starting from either of this level set and go towards the optimal solution, which is here. Or start from each of these points and then go down here. Later on, you see some of the approximation methods uh, that are used all the time, actually, in neural network. They are using gradient descent. Um, for their own space, and uh, we, we, uh, we talked about it, uh, we will talk about it actually more in upcoming lectures. But for now, the method that we are focused in is we are using an analytical uh, method to derive the W stars. Okay, so first of all, as I talked in, in uh, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, we are, when we are talking about going towards certain direction, definitely we are interested in computing the, the gradients, right? And gradients are actually derivations equated with uh, respect to certain variables. In this case, it's W. So in order to minimize that, so we are interested in you know, uh, computing the, the matrix of uh, gradients of E in of W with respect to those W's. So if you do the D E in with respect to W1 and also with respect to W0 of that previous formula that we derived, so you're going to have 2 and then you have to uh, equal it to 0, right? We're going to have 6 W0's from uh, plus 10 W1 equal to 0 and then we have on the second one, we have 6W0 plus uh, 6W1 equal to 12. So using these two, we can easily compute W0 and W1. And that was the one that I showed in the previous slide. So that's your actually W star here. Right? That's your W star. I mean, this, uh, this was only a two-dimensional... Two um, problem, so it was pretty easy to understand. In a larger cases, you might need to find another approximation.
such as gradient descent and so on and so forth that we we will talk about in neural network. Yeah. So, uh, if I remember, gradient is the slope of steepest ascent. So or descent. Or descent. Yeah. So why are we calculating the gradient? Are we trying to get to that point? That yeah. Point? In general, yes. You see, when we are so here. When we are talking about the level sets, so the first level set is actually the outer one, right, on top. And the last one, which has the W star, actually the one here. So we're actually starting from the surface of here, and we are interested in going that way, right? But this is a very small problem. We can solve it analytically, right? Uh, on, on, on a very big uh, scale problem in higher dimensions, you need some approximations. Uh, and some iterative method that you can use to approximate. Okay, so that was the that was the first approach. We got to the to the point. Let's talk about the geometrical approach for that. Question. I was going to ask that. Um, how did we get e n w equals two again from five negative thirty? If if you if you assign this number to that formula, you're going to find that. So that's going to be the, oh, okay. the 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 minimal error we can find with, with this minimization, right? Oh, because x is 1, right? Did we let x equals 1? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Questions? Uh, on the uh, previous slide, sorry, my fault. Yeah, um, in this, how did we, uh, I'm unable to like, show how did we get 1 by 3 per second in the This one? Yeah. 1 over 3? Yeah. Just the numbers. 1 over n. You remember in the, in the vector form, we are computing the norm? which we show it this way, square. In a non-vector uh, non form, this becomes a summation of your 1 over n, oh, yeah. okay. and, right? Okay. All good? OK. All right, so let's see the first method, which is a geometric one. Again, this is a very uh, easy sample. We can just visualize it easily. So it's as if. So we are trying to find the smallest distance, which is that E here. And the E is the difference between your actual labels or actual uh, values, which is Y, and your Y hat, which is your prediction, right? So this is your error that you are trying to find, right? On that example, you had like these points and these points, and that was the line you fit. So that's the error you want to find. But think about it in, think about this as a hyperplane. So you want to project that to find an orthogonal, uh, you know, vector over that. So E is actually y minus y hat, right? And our y was from the previous slides. We have uh, six, zero, and zero. This, this is called a subspace P, which is in three-dimensional space right now. OK, so we talked about the, the span of matrix. And we can define C0 and C1 as the first and second column of your x, right? So this is your first. That's your second. OK. So we are interested in finding w hat, which is equal to x multiplied w, so that your column, uh, the vector cx and c1 can be multiplied to w. That's your span of design matrix x. And there is a precondition to use this, this sort of uh, simplified geometric method. And that is the case that these columns should be orthogonal, right? I'll, I'll explain in, in, the, in the next slide um, what if that wasn't the case. And I mean, which is going to be a little bit outside of uh, our scope. But there are other algorithms that you can approximate this geometrical approach. But for now, 
we, we will show that these two columns are actually orthogonal to the subspace. So, as a definition, again, these are spanning C0 and C1, and they are in the subspace of P, okay? So, so Y hat, as I mentioned, is a vector in subspace P, closest to Y, because why is this closest? Can anyone mention why? That's right. Because there is no other line that is uh, that has the uh, you know fewer distance between these two, and that actually is because it's perpendicular. And also, y hat must be the projection of y onto p, and we error uh, and the the vector of error will be calculated by the difference of these two. Must be also the or, uh, orthogonal to every vector in p. So that was the case for us that c1 and c zeros were also orthogonal to E, we can actually show that up here and we can see actually that the, the, the transpose of your E multiplies CX which was the, the, the span of the first column and the C1 which was the, the second column, is that the, the result is actually zero so this shows that both of them are perpendicular here, so here, so there, right? So we can see E spans C0 and C1. Questions? Yeah. Uh, in this place where we have the points and where is our like, where, where, where we have that points x1 and x2? Where? Three points. Like in this place where we have the points. What do you mean by points? Zero, one, two, three. So the same one. Are you talking about the matrix X? I want to uh, I want to ask like in this place where we have that point so that we can find uh, like in this figure where we have exactly where So those Y's are the actual points, right? This Y is the output, uh, it's just the Y. Uh, yeah. Zero, zero. It, How about the zero one two? Where is the zero one two here? C1. Oh so this these these are the, the, the first and second column of your X matrix. You remember here, we mentioned it here. So this, this is your first column of X. And this is the second. So, so okay, I see, I understand. Okay, the, so, okay. so the, you cannot directly observe this, but it's a, uh, it's a column that is panned to the subspace of uh, P, right? It's, it's kind of hard to visualize it here. Um, it would be easier to visualize it in, in, a, in a different dimension. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to think how you're going to visualize it. Um, because it's not in this dimension. I'll, I'll come up with a good uh, explanation, yeah. Yeah, but that, that was a good question. Okay, so by these two, we understood that C1 and C0 are actually spanning E here, okay? Because the, they are perpendicular. And then when we calculate E, is actually the difference between your Y and Y hat. And that's the result, 1 minus 2 and 1. So, it's just enough for us that we compute having this condition having this condition checked we just need to compute the output of this matrix in this case we have only C1 and C0 and we have to multiply that to find the W's I mentioned what if, if that wasn't the case if the uh, orthogonal columns were not found, right, we need another approximation which is called, uh, which we use um, gram schmidt algorithm, and it just basically uses Euclidean distance, but it's outside the, the, the scope of our uh, course. Questions, yeah? Can you just go over how you got on the last slide? Yeah, it, it's just a difference between your y and y hat. But do we know what that difference 
Yeah, because because we have we have projected a line here already. That was the L here. Suppose you have that line already, that L. Okay. Yeah. That's just an example. Okay. Yeah. Is it clear for everyone? Questions? You seem very worried. Oh, also I recalled, I posted another set of um, pages on several examples on least squares on your Moodle. I'm not sure, have you seen it already? If you go to your Moodle on extra materials, perhaps, you, you find some other examples of this. But if you're, if you're given a question in your exam, it would be as easy as this. I mean, I don't want to just bombard you with like non-necessary calculation. I just want to make sure that you understand what a span is, how do you compute the differences, and just perhaps a two-dimensional, you know. Yeah. So what did that last expression mean exactly? So what have we found using that expression? It's, it's actually this, uh, the one on top. So can you just explain that? About it's just the multiplication of these two, right? That the one the one on top is the vector space, but actually when you expand this, you need to compute this and sum them up, right? It's actually this that summation. Like what is it? Like what is it calculating? It's going to calculate your W's. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And since that's the span, that W is W star. Okay. Okay. Everyone got the idea because. Those vectors are span with e. This w will become w star because it's, it's, the, it's the shortest one, right? So it's going to find a minimization of the error. All right. So that was just two methods for you to uh, compute that minimization problem of least square. In reality, there are um, other factors could be at play here, and one of the most famous techniques that people in machine learning and in statistical science do is by regularization, right? So for many of the methods that you have in machine learning, you have some form of an extension of a regularized version of that for, uh, formula. For instance, for least square methods that we, we uh, talked about, we have a regularized this is square method with that. So I'll, I'll, I'm just going to explain what that is. So the first chunk of that formula is actually your good old minimization technique, right? So by adding the, the second term here, using a hyperparameter, we call it lambda, and we, we involve the w as well, we add a, an ex, extra term, we call it a penalty term, right? so that we can control the way we solve a problem. Or in a sense, we are regularizing the, the method. Now we can play around with that parameter, lambda, right? And come to different points. It's as if we are, we are it's, as if it's, it's a controlled knob, right? You can switch it a little bit left and right and play around with the number you can assign to lambda. And you're going to find different Ws, right? So this, this sort of techniques in machine learning and deep learning, especially, uh, is called uh, regularization methods, right? So now, if um, by increasing this, you see it's going to impact your Ws, and also at the end, it's going to impact this, right? We call it a re regularization coefficient. So now the question is, how are we going to select that lambda to play with? Are we going to select it randomly? Are we going to just go iteratively with different 
lambdas and see what works the best? In reality, um, we select these hyperparameters. So I'm just going to write it here. Hyper. Parameter, hyperparam. We normally select through cross validation. So, what does cross validation mean? We actually have um, a separate lecture on that perhaps after midterm, but for now, um, think about it as you have this chunk of data as your matrix X, right? What if, if I want to train using this data? What if I split this, right, into some portion of my training and the rest, I don't touch it for training. I train by this and I use the remaining data as my test, right? It's as if I'm cross-validating these two results with the same data set. Another method for cross-validation is you can chunk up your matrix X data into N separate uh, training data sets, right? From 0 to N. And then you train only with this chunk and you test the error. You train with this and you test another error, which is going to be E2, E1, and up to EN, right? And find out which one work the best and use that specific one. So f finding that lambda truth cr uh, cross validation is like you can chunk up your training data set and apply the training algorithm and find what works the best given your data set in your um, method. Is that clear? Yeah. One of the major one of the main reasons that uh, we use regularization is to have a more robust output. Sometimes if you don't regularize, you have uh, an unstable solution, right? By this regularization, you can stabilize sort of your output in a way. Yeah? Uh, at what point does chunking your data set stop producing? Um, at what point are you chunking your data set too small to actually get uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. Actually, we have a full lecture on that. There is a lot of theory on how to, how to slice your uh, training data, what's going to be the, um, the minimum error rate you have to consider, what, what's the theory behind that, yeah, what's the relation between your test error and training error. So these are all will be done in one lecture after your midterm. Yeah, a good question, yeah. Any more questions? All right. <coughs> so, if you expand that regularize least square, your your final W star of your now regularized LS would be this, including that lambda, and then. You can easily see that if you assign zero, it's as if you don't have any lambdas anymore. So your hyperparameter will be gone because that i is the identity matrix. doesn't do anything. And in general, it's going to stabilize your solution and then it's going to help overfitting. We're going to talk about overfitting as well. But just for now, um, think about it as a form of stabilization. So you have a sort of a stable output. <laughs> okay, so, so far, what we've seen, we're all in linear Space, right? Your problem were linear, your lines were linear, your data set was linearly separable. So let's see what we're going to do when we don't have that luxury, right? So let's talk about nonlinear transformations. 
as you might think, linear separability is limited in many scopes as, as a very small, ans uh, a small you know, data set. You can see it's obvious that there is no single line I can separate this data, right? I cannot do this. I'll have error on both sides. I can do that even this. Anyway, I do. I'm going to have some error here. So let's see how we're going to deal with such data, which is not linearly separable. In general, many features in real world, many features are affecting the output, right? And they are not linear. For instance, you might not be able to find a, a linear W to express all your features. For instance, years in residence, or I don't know, the age or the income, and so on and so forth. So for those, you need to have a way to transform your nonlinear space, perhaps, into, into a linear space. Let's see how we're going to do that. And in general, as you know, uh, linear regression is working because there is linearity uh, in the weight we are computing, right? That was the, the summation of i's from 0 to d of your doubly transpose x. On the classification case, we just had to do the output of that sine matrix as as plus one or minus one, right? That was the difference. So how are we going to achieve this? Okay. So we have to achieve this through transforming your data, right? For instance, we have this data, the data you saw on the previous slide. This is not a linear separable data because there is no such single lines that I can correctly classify all my points of two classes, blue and red, right? I call this the original um, space having x1 and x2, right? So what if I found a transformation function I call it phi here or, or phi that square the values of x1 and x2 on both dimensions. I have two dimensions on the space, x1 and x2. So you, you can easily see that if you if you compute the square value of those blue dots and the red dots, right? Now in the transformed space, they are easily separable. And they're linearly separable, actually. So you can fit a line here now, a linear line. Assume that it's a linear line. Right? All these four regions go high. And this region, because it was around 0 and very small, you square that is going to get even smaller. And it all goes down here. Is that clear why it happened? So you see, by looking at that data and by scoring those values, now we could separate this in a linearly separable data set. Right now, we call the new axis of the transform space in Z space. So now X1 and X2 became Z1 and Z2. So your Z1 actually transforms your X1 up to uh, 2 X1 square, and Z2 do the same to your x2, right? We call this phi function or phi function feature transform, right? That does a transformation. Yeah, that's, that's just, yeah. And that's the complexity of transformation. If we knew how to transform everything from any nonlinear data set, that would be because all the problems at the end could have been solved with just a PLA, right? Yeah, but for every data set, uh, we need, if, if we are using a linear trans, uh, a nonlinear transformation, we need to take into account how we're going to solve the output, what's the price to pay, what are the degree of polynomials that we are going, I mean, in this case, we are just going to the degree of 2, right? What if a data needed like a degree of 17? Is it, is it going to overfit our data if a new test data comes into hand? So there are so many factors involved, right? But yeah, it's, it's specific to each data. 
That's great. All right. Now let's um, formalize this a little bit. So actually, that was your. If you think about that transformation, it was actually doing this separation for you. If you bring it back to the original space, this is actually a circular sort of line for you, right? So your x's in the original space were from x0 was 1, actually, so as, as you know. So we have 1, x1, and x2. Your phi of x, or phi of x, was 1, x1 raised to 2, and then x2 is square, right? So our hypothesis now uses this z, and then we can apply a linear classifier using that hypothesis that z uses. So it's a sine of z1 and z2 minus 1. And actually, z1 plus z2 is equal to 1. Right. And your g of x was the the output is actually at x x squared plus x two x squared plus uh, minus one. Okay. So we can define let z is a phi of x be a nonlinear transform in z space. So which is equal to w transpose x, right? And that would make this one the edge of z, a linear transform. So this is a linear transform now. So at the end, we can call the hypothesis of phi of x is a nonlinear classification in x space. And phi of dot, so this is the function, is known as a feature transform that I mentioned in the previous slide. Right? That's just the formalization for that. Space and Z space. Z space is the new, like yeah, it's a transform space. Yeah. And actually the original. That's right. Yeah. So looking at the transform space from the side of the original space is as if you have done a circular classification instead of a single line, right? But going to the transform space, you're looking at it as a linear line. That's why this is a linear. Because it's in the transform Z space, right? It's just the way you look at the the space. Professor, why are you using phi dot instead of phi x? No, that, that that's just representing a function. Yeah, it's a it's a phi function. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, uh, one other question. So phi x is not linear in the new space, but w x. So phi of x is itself is a nonlinear transformation, but when it Transform to the transform space inside that the output is not linear. Uh, it, it's, it's not nonlinear anymore. It's linear. But if you are staying still at the original space and looking at the transform space, that for you is not linear, right? Okay. Can anyone know the answer? Yeah, it's just a different, uh, yeah, it's just an approximated yeah. circle, yeah. Again, uh, this is for specific for this case, to have a bigger unit. That's right. You might have even, I don't know, two, like you have higher dimensions, perhaps you want to go with this, and then another one like this. Yeah. It depends on the degree, right? So more degree gives you more freedom and more problems as well, at the same time. Okay. So... So in general, we are interested in applying that phi function to go from x into z space. So your x1 up to xn becomes z1 up to zd. And so that's the 
generalization case. Let's see an example. Uh, I'll, I'll post actually some of the some examples with some solutions um, to 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 Moodle, so you have some practices as well. Because I don't think we have time for uh, more examples on this. But as a, as a quick review, so see, this is the way we look at it. So we started from this original data. All the x's were in the capital X, our, our training data, right? We applied the phi function. It became a trans. Uh, a, a, we are in the transformation transform space, and then we separate the data using a linear uh, classifier, which is the sine double tilde of transpose z, right? And then going back or looking back from the original data is as if we did this, right? A nonlinear transformation on the data. These are the numbers, the actual numbers of the results, just as uh, just for you know better comprehension. So this one is actually starting from the original space. It's as if we are doing this. A nonlinear PLA on your data with these coefficients, 0 0.6. Okay. Now let's see if we can expand this to higher dimensions. In general, uh, we call this method polynomial curve fitting, and that was the that was the uh, that was some of the slides that I put on Moodle for you. If you, if you take a look at your model, there's a case study on higher dimensions as well. But just as, as an uh, introduction for that, so in general, we call this polynomial curve fitting, right? And depending on the degree of a polynomial, which we can calculate it very easy by summing all the exponents of the variables, right? We can apply a different degree of polynomial for your data. So in this case, this this formula has a degree of 5. Why? Because the, the highest non-negative uh, exponents are equal to 5, right? If you have x3 and x2 and uh, y2. So, so uh, many of those degrees are having names. For instance, um, 0 would be a non-zero constant. Of, of course, it's going to be constant. 1 would be a linear case that we all know. Degree of 2, we call it the quadratic. The, the third degree, we call it a, a cubic. And degree of four, we call it a quartic, and then so on and so forth. So these are the the Latin word we call for that. So for the for the second degree, our linear regression becomes a quadratic regression, right? As an example, we have these three uh, points again: so zero and six, zero and uh, 1 and 0 and 2 and 0, okay? So now we are trying to, instead of fit a, a straight line, we are trying to fit a quadratic line, right? A degree of 2. So it's as if our y is equal to w transpose z, so the z space has z0, of course, equal to 1, and then we have z1 and z2 as x and x2. This is the, the coefficient of this space in a quadratic form, right? So the W will become uh, your previous W, which was W0, W1X, and uh, W2 becomes W1X and W2X2. You can easily compute the, the coefficient matrix of that Z. The first column would be the Z1s, which are 1, I'm oh, sorry, z zeros, which are 1, and then this is z1 and z2, right? You see this 2 becomes 4, and 1 becomes 1, because these are the square. And these are your, again, your y values, 6, 0, and 0, and we are interested in finding the w's here using a quadratic regression. So the line would be as easy to calculate as this. So the final y would be 6 minus 9x plus 3x2, right? 
Is that clear why? So for each of those degrees, there is uh, a form to start with, which goes in a higher degree, and then you have to calculate those coefficients respectively. Is that clear? And if you just generalize it to, a, to an n degree, right, to any degree, the generalization form would become something like this. These are actually your w's, those betas, your coefficients, right? Your w's. This is the error term. In general, we can compute it because um, if those coefficients are not optimal, definitely there are errors. So these are the error term. And then we have to compute the w's, or our beta here, using the, the pseudo-inverse again, just as before. Is that clear? So if you go to... Um, I'm just going to skim through that curve fitting, but you can have a look at it later. Uh, let me see if I can make my screen. So that actually is your reading one one, but I thought it would be beneficial for you to understand what regression and classification is before starting with curve fitting, right? I'm just going to skim through this because you have it already in your Moodle. So you're starting from different levels. So suppose you have these, these, these blue dots, right? So one way in a degree of zero is just one constant line, that, that red line over there, right? But you can go higher in dimensions in degree of one, degree of two. It's going to get closer. You're going to overfit to your data again more and more. On this specific case, you are reducing your training error, but you are, you know, uh, diminishing your uh, chance of generalization. So your testing error would be go higher. So we call this phenomenon over overfitting, and we talk about it extensively in, in in a lecture after midterm. You can go even higher to a degree of nine. You see how many curves you can define because at the end of the day, when you have higher degrees, you have more freedom. Your, your derivatives have, uh, you have more derivatives to work with, like to, uh, at least eight, eight levels up to the point that you, back, you reach back to the constant value, right? So you can find more complex shapes for that. We talked about, uh, we, we will talk about the test and training error later as well, but just to have a case study, you can have a look at that at home. Any questions for today's lecture? All good? All right, so I'm just going to stop here, perhaps, because uh, quadratic regression uh, will take a long, longer time, so we won't make it by to, uh, today. So on Wednesday, we're going to start with uh, quadratic regression, which is the base of neural network. And then afterward, we're going to go towards uh, multi-layer perceptron and neural network and expect your first assignment to be posted in, in, in a few few days so you're gonna have an announcement in Moodle